When I started teaching philosophy many years ago, I was asked by my then department if I would teach a course called Hegel, Nietzsche, and Existentialism. It was a course created by the eminent Nietzsche scholar Walter Kaufman, and the title itself gives rise to a very interesting question. Nietzsche is often considered as one of the existentialists, not Nietzsche and existentialism at all. And the question about whether he should be so classified is a very interested, interesting and complicated one. I love both Nietzsche and the existentialists. Thinking of existentialism as that movement of eccentrics from the mid-19th century with the religious thinker Kierkegaard through culminating in the philosophy of the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre. The watchword of existentialism is freedom. And so in many ways the question about whether Nietzsche is or is not an existentialist comes down to the question of does Nietzsche agree with the existentialists on the importance and centrality and nature of freedom? And I think the answer, which of course will satisfy no one, is both yes and no. Freedom is a word that of course has a very long philosophical and theological history. But sticking to modern times, freedom was in one sense the watchword of the Enlightenment. And in many ways, freedom was represented by the very liberal stance, which said in French, laissez-faire, leave us alone. It's a conception of freedom which is largely negative. In other words, we should be left apart from government interference, interference by the majority, interference from whatever moral forces or institutions might want to step on our territory. But in Germany in particular, that notion of freedom was not thought well of because it represented a kind of negative freedom. It said, here's what shouldn't happen to us, but it didn't say anything much about what we should do. And so in Germany in particular, the notion of freedom that developed was a sense of positive freedom, a sense of freedom not from constraints and interference, but freedom to, freedom to participate, freedom to be part of something, freedom to educate oneself, the freedom to have a career. And so the freedom that develops in Germany, unlike, for example, the freedom that was dominant in much of the rhetoric in England and France, was a freedom that wasn't simply a matter of individual choice and wasn't simply a matter of freedom from interference, but rather it had to do with the freedom to do or to be something else. In Nietzsche, in particular, insofar as the word freedom means anything like what the other philosophers meant by it, freedom is going to be the freedom to be or rather to become who one is. Now Nietzsche rejects negative freedom on many, re on many grounds. For one thing, he rejects democracy in general. He rejects it because he thinks mere choice, majority choice, or the choice of people in general by any scheme who are uneducated, who are un inexperienced in the ways of government, or inexperienced in the culture should not count for very much. Their interests should be taken into account, of course. Their needs must be taken into account. Nevertheless, there is a sense in which freedom does not have anything like the meaning that we in America, for example, so often give to it, in which freedom and democracy are so closely linked. In general, the idea of freedom as simply freedom from constraint is something that Nietzsche would look down upon as being a kind of a fantasy. And in fact, it's the fantasy, as we will see of so many other things, of the oppressed. The truth is, if you simply give someone, let's say, a, a, a paintbrush and a canvas, and we say, do whatever you want, what you're probably going to get is junk. And the reason for this is that great art and great things in general are not expressions of freedom from all constraint, but quite the contrary. The great poet Goethe, whom Nietzsche often refers to, 
had an expression, which he shared with many of his colleagues. And the expression was, freedom within limits. And it's the limits that define greatness. If you think of that form of Japanese painting, for example, where you get just one brush stroke. Once you've lifted the brush from the paper, you're done. That is a challenge, and some great creativity comes out of it. Or, to stick with the Japanese for a second, if you haiku, you get a fixed number of syllables, no more, no less. And the talent, the creativity, is seeing what you can do within that very constrained medium. So it is with human life. We are constrained by many things. We are constrained by our culture, by our tradition, by our biology, by the circumstances of history. And while we can struggle against them, in some sense even reject them, nevertheless, they are always there as constraints on our behavior. And freedom, if it's to mean anything at all, has to be freedom within those limitations. Freedom for Nietzsche, I think, could be summarized in one phrase, and it by far is most important to him. As we've said in earlier lectures, Nietzsche is not particularly political, although he does have some nasty things to say about democracy and about socialism and about some other social movements. But in fact, what Nietzsche is concerned about is the individual, and in particular, creativity. The phrase, I think, that captures Nietzsche's view of freedom is the freedom to create. And the ultimate ideal of a culture, of a politics, is in addition to doing the sorts of routine things that politics has to do, it is more than anything else to cultivate citizens who can create, people who can move forward the culture, people who can express what that culture is, and of course, people who can think for themselves and experiment, as Nietzsche tries to do, in new ways. I say Nietzsche is an individualist, but I want to be very careful with that, too, because there's a sense in which individualism is a very bourgeois notion. There's a sense in which the individual is a modern creation, and historians, in fact, have pinpointed it fairly carefully. The notion of the individual comes prominent basically in the 12th century. Now, the 12th century is interesting for all sorts of reasons. 12th century is when the Crusades were going on. 12th century is when feudalism was breaking down. 12th century was when traditional marital social arrangements were falling apart. 12th century is when love was invented in its courtly style in southern France by the troubadours. In the 12th century, because of the breakdown of the social fabric, because of the emphasis on what we now would refer to as romantic love, because of the need for people to find their own way in the world, the concept of the individual became increasingly important. With the Renaissance in particular, there was a rediscovery of the ancients, who by the way were not individualists, but nevertheless had a sense of individualism which was nevertheless more robust than, for example, what we had inherited from the medieval traditions. In the 18th century, in the 19th century, both the Enlightenment and Romanticism emphasized individualism to a very large degree. The Enlightenment, because the individual was the unit of reason, the unit of society, and it was a common Enlightenment view that a society was nothing but the cooperation and the getting together of individuals. In fact, even the contracts which they would form according to which they would be members of society with the implication, as was evidenced in the French Revolution, that if they didn't like the terms of the contract or if the contract was breached, they could turn away and remain individuals. In Romanticism, the picture is a bit more complicated. On the one hand, Romanticism specializes in this kind of cosmic view, the sort of thing I described in the Friedrich painting of the cloudy landscape or the Wagner overture in which we get these swirling sense of the universe, Schopenhauer's will. But at the same time, the individual is a very important piece of the picture. 
What's interesting, of course, from a historical point of view, is how with this emphasis on the cosmic and the universal, or in the Enlightenment case, on universal reason, and on the other hand, the individual as the emphasis, what gets left out in the middle is to a large extent the family, community, politics. Alistair McIntyre says in one of his books that reading the 18th century philosophers, the one conclusion he is forced to is that none of them had families. But of course, the same would be true of Nietzsche. Nietzsche talks very much about the individual, even the lone individual, doesn't talk that much about society, which he sometimes refers to as the herd. And insofar as he talks about the cosmos, it's usually in a rather artful, not very scientific, and certainly not metaphysical way. What's important for Nietzsche is the individual and the individual's ability to create. But this has to be distinguished from what we might call the individual's ability to choose. And there's a very central core of Nietzsche's philosophy, which is, in this sense, very unlike the existentialists. If you look at someone like Kierkegaard, the most important thing is to choose. Kierkegaard outlines for us a number of possible ways of existence, what we would call lifestyles. He says, for example, one could be an artist or a hedonist. One could be a very moral person. One can be a religious devotee, as he was. But this can't be defended on rational grounds. And what's more, there are no ultimate reasons why an individual should choose one mode rather than another. Rather, the important thing is the choice itself. So one chooses to be a Christian, as he did. And what that means is that one, kind of in a vacuum of sorts, one commits oneself to this alternative and in so doing pushes aside the others. Or in Jean-Paul Sartre, this uh, century, what we find in Sartre is a powerful metaphysical thesis, a sort of story about the nature of human existence in which the absolute freedom, his phrase, the absolute freedom of the individual to choose is always with us. And Sartre has a very harsh notion of freedom. We are responsible because we have chosen everything. We are responsible for what we do, even if it doesn't seem as if we've chosen it, as if we just happened upon it, we are nevertheless responsible. We could have somehow resisted. We are responsible for who we are. This is something that we become through our various choices. And we are responsible for the state of society. If there is still poverty, then we are responsible for it because we haven't chosen to do enough. And what's more, we are responsible for humanity and what human being means. Because if I decide to be selfish, possibly with a rationalization, well, everyone's selfish. What I'm doing is not just making a decision for myself, but I am implicitly stating, here's what it means to be human. And I am, in effect, encouraging other people to make the same kind of decision, in which case, human nature will be selfish because that's what we've decided. Now, all of this is emphatically un-Nietzschean. For Nietzsche, the whole question of choice is something that's thrown into a radical kind of questioning. He's not like Sartre. He's not like Kierkegaard, although he resembles them pretty well in other aspects. But unlike them, he says there are always not only constraints on our behavior, but there are determinants of our behavior something which Sartre quite explicitly denies. We make choices for Sartre, again, in a kind of vacuum, in which causal accounts, causal explanations about neurology, about our upbringing, our psychology, about human nature, all this is put in suspension as we make the choice. For Nietzsche, that's impossible. One might say that Nietzsche is a biological determinist. And I don't want to take this too strictly. But what it means is, in line with many other things we've said now about Nietzsche's emphasis on naturalism, about his emphasis on drives and instincts, many of which come down to us from our heritage rather than being things that we learn through our culture, there's a sense in which Nietzsche wants to say that what appear to be choices aren't really choices at all. 
Rather, it's a kind of destiny. And this can all sound very mysterious, and I'll try and make it a little bit more mysterious at the end of the lecture. But I think the right way to think about it is in terms of a phrase that he picks up from the Greek poet Pindar. We've mentioned it before. It's a very simple phrase. It says, become who you are. Well, that's a fascinating notion. It's not be who you are, the kind of uh, unhelpful advice that teenagers get from their parents when they're going out on a date and they're told, just be yourself, dear. Uh, they get a, right, a rightful look of, what? <laughs> on the other hand, there's a sense in which to say, be who you are, implies a kind of stasis, something that doesn't change. For Nietzsche, the sort of line between freedom and unfreedom, between choice and lack of choice, here gets very blurry, because what he wants to say is that we are all born with certain sorts of abilities, talents, potentials, some more, some less, but virtually none of us is simply raised in such a way or thrown in such circumstances that these simply emerge. Rather, it's the case that cultivating who one is is a lifelong effort. That when he says in the birth of science, sorry, when he says in the birth of tragedy, life is to be justified only as an aesthetic phenomenon. And the theme that sort of goes through, live your life as a work of art. What's implied there is something very much like Goethe's notion of freedom within limitation that the creativity of the individual is to a large extent creating oneself, but not on a blank canvas with a set of oil paints and the instructions, anything goes, certainly a very popular American belief, something that one can read rather easily in the philosophy of Sartre, but quite to the contrary. It's a very limited canvas and it's a very limited palette. And what one can paint is as restricted as, for example, one of those Japanese paintings where you only get one line, that line being your life. There's a sense in which when Nietzsche says, following Pindar, become who you are, what he's talking about is something that is very ancient in a way. It's a thesis that was defended by Aristotle and which is defended often today under the name of self-realization or it's even self-fulfillment, although that smacks too much of just trying to be happy. The idea of self-realization is that you are born into a certain pattern, into a family, into a social class, into a culture, into a tradition. And all that says a great deal about who you could be. And while Nietzsche clearly adopts this kind of lion-like posture of saying no, of roaring against the tradition, and while he praises the creativity of a child, the simple fact of the matter is children aren't born in a vacuum. Children are born into families. Children are born learning one language or two languages rather than the others. Children are born into a culture, into a tradition. They are raised in certain ways. And depending on which of the psychoanalysts you believe, by the time you are two or four or seven or at least 13, you pretty much are the person you are. Or rather, you have already shown the basic shape of the person you can become. I remember several years ago, I won't tell you how many, I went to my high school reunion. Um, it was a fascinating endeavor, something I recommend to everyone. Of course, when I talk to my college students about it, they can't think of anything less interesting. But believe me, when you get 15, 20 years out of high school, and go back and meet your old classmates, most of whom you haven't seen or heard from in all that time, something becomes transparently obvious. And that is, with only a few exceptions, they still are the person that they were in high school. They've grown in a number of different dimensions, but nevertheless, they're the same person. Obvious sort of analogy. You see a, a small twiglet in the ground which is sprouting from, say, an acorn. And if you come back 50 years later 
It might be a muddy oak tree. But what would be interesting would be that the basic shape of the oak tree was evident even in the little twiglet, that it grows, it goes through enormous changes, but what it changes into is a fulfillment, a realization of itself. Now, in the oak tree case, it's pretty clear that the notion of choice doesn't make any sense at all. In the human case, Sartre would say, the choice is really everything, whatever the circumstances, whatever the shape you're given at, as a child. He says this against Freud, for example. It's your responsibility what you become. Not so for Nietzsche. For Nietzsche, there are many choices along the way. But the choices are all already along this dimension in accordance with this shape. So, for example, as a teenager, we all have the possibility and, unfortunately, the likelihood of making a number of ruinous choices. Choices which will, in effect, block our development and our self-realization. Of course, we also have choices, the other side of those. Choices which, although we may not realize it till later, are choices which will augment, enhance, help us along in that road to self-realization. And often, we don't know what they are. Again, Nietzsche sometimes says, often says, one has to trust one's instincts, that when one acts on the basis of what we would call impulse, on the basis of gut feelings, one is very often much more in tune with the person you are or could become than when you reason. In fact, reason, once again, is a certain kind of problem. Because with reason, what we are often doing is accepting the wisdom of the culture around us, which may or not be suited for us. And if what we can be is creative individuals, then accepting what's already been given is going to be quite against our ultimate interests. This is a point, again, where Nietzsche follows and doesn't follow Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer talked about species in general as if they were the manifestation of a single idea. So there's an important sense in which one horse is like any other horse, in which one dog is like any other dog, with which I, of course, vehemently disagree. But nevertheless, the idea is that among the animals and the plants and in nature more generally, there's a sense in which an idea simply takes on different manifestations, slightly different shapes and forms, but ultimately, it's the same idea. With human beings, however, every person has his or her own idea. Now, we're here not talking about the kind of ideas you might have in your mind, but rather, each one has their own particular destiny, their own particular character to fill out. And for Schopenhauer, much of an understanding of human nature is to understand it on the basis of this kind of individuality. But of course, this individuality is compromised by the fact that within each of us, what drives us is ultimately this universal will, which pushes us through various desires and urges in various ultimately irrational directions. Nietzsche, while accepting certain pieces of this picture, for example, the individualist aspect of it, nevertheless rejects others. And in particular, as we've already noted, he rejects Schopenhauer's notion of the universal will. There's a sense in which the will is in each one of us. But even there, Nietzsche wants to raise some skeptical questions. Do we have a will in the sense that either Schopenhauer or more rationalistically Kant suggests? When we do things, do we decide to do them? Or rather, is in some sense the deed done through us? This raises a number of very complicated questions, all of which have to do with, first of all, the notion of free will as it's been defended in philosophy ever since Augustine. And secondly, the notion of the self, which of course has always been one of the foci of philosophy, particularly since Socrates. In Nietzsche, the idea of the self, like everything else, is naturalistic. It's empirical. Now this is to be distinguished from all those people who would say the self is ultimately the soul, and in that sense it is, in some sense, part of the other world, or some aspect of the divine that's somehow in us. For Nietzsche, you might say, it's secular 
all the way through. The self, if it exists at all, is going to be another feature of us that biology and psychology can simply explain. And to say that the self is empirical is to disagree with Kant, who talked about the self in very grandiose terms. The self as transcendental, the agent behind all of our knowledge, or talking about the self as the self of freedom, who, again, outside the causal connections of the world, acts as if it can make free choices. For Nietzsche, to reject the notion of the will is to reject the notion of free will. To accept such a notion of self is to reject the idea that there is something in us, something different from our biological being, which can make choices, which can apply concepts, which can do all the things that these philosophers had suggested. In fact, agency itself becomes a problem for Nietzsche, as it had been for Schopenhauer. Now, for Schopenhauer, the reason is fairly straightforward. Even though he talks about us as individuals, what ultimately drives us is not something that belongs to us individually at all, but the will. For Nietzsche, it's a more subtle problem. The more subtle problem is that talking about agency, talking about free will, talking about choice, in a way, for example, that Kant does, presumes that there is a self in us, which, even if it's not part of another world, nevertheless is a very curious, independent subject, which has only outward ties to our bodies, to the world, to our actions. So I can decide to do this, or to be this, or to make this change in the world. But Nietzsche asked the question, what kind of a self is that? And here again, what we get from Nietzsche are very often some rather outlandish statements, but understood in context. It's a thesis which is well worth considering. Put it this way, what makes us think that we are the agents of our own actions? In particular, why, when it comes to thinking, are we so sure that we are thinkers? This goes back to one of the classic phrases in philosophy, when Descartes declares, I think, therefore I am. And even in his own day, some of his competitors were arguing, well, okay, uh, yeah, maybe you're thinking, but why do you think you are? Or more to the point and more philosophically, why do you think you're thinking? Why not say something like, there are thoughts present, and leave open the question of who's doing the thinking? Or Nietzsche says, in one of his very best aphorisms, in fact, one that Freud picks out as an inspiration for much that he does, Nietzsche says, a thought comes when it will, not when I will. And if you think about your thinking, what becomes obvious is that thoughts sort of pop in. And even if you've been working on a problem, as a great many brilliant scientists and creators have shown, even if you're working on a problem, it's very likely that you'll pop up at 3 o'clock in the morning and there's the idea, there's the solution. Or as I stand here talking to you, there's a strange sense in which I'm not choosing the words that are coming out of my mouth. I mean, there's a sense in which something's going on of a very elaborate nature. But if I think in terms of what am I willing as I do this talking, the answer is, I don't know. It's as if the words are just coming out. The picture that Nietzsche wants to give us is that we overemphasize agency, and with it we overemphasize freedom, and we emphasize choice. And getting back to the larger picture about becoming who you are, the truth is that we have to go back to a much earlier notion, which of course is very large in the Greeks and it's often vulgarized. But it's the notion of fate. Nietzsche has a phrase, amor fati, the love of fate. And what he means by this, in part, is a kind of acceptance of life, and your life in particular, an acceptance of who you are, what your limitations are. But not just that, but it's also this sense of having a destiny, the sense that you can and will be something if you work really hard to cultivate it. So it's anything but a quietist philosophy. He rejects the notion of freedom in the existentialist sense, 
Nevertheless, he emphasizes what the existentialists all emphasize, and that is the importance of individual existence and seeing to it that you take responsibility for who you are.